Good morning and happy Sabbath. We welcome you once again to Sabbath School from Fairmont Seventh-day Adventist Church here in Lodi, California. We welcome all of our local church members to our online Sabbath School this morning. And all those from far away, we welcome you back into our Sabbath School lesson this morning from all across the country and from around the world, and especially our friends down in South Africa. God bless you, and thank you for tuning in to worship the Lord with us this morning. Uh, today is the final uh, topic in our current lesson quarterly. Uh, our title this morning is A Step in Faith. But before we uh, start into our lesson, uh, let us go before the throne of grace and talk to our Father. Precious Heavenly Father God, we come to you once again this blessed Sabbath day, and we bring all praise and glory and honor into your throne room. We come into your presence to give you praise, to give you honor, and to ask for the presence of your Holy Spirit with us right now as we dive into your word, into your scriptures, and let your spirit speak to each and every one of us, myself included. I ask that your spirit would give me the words to say, and that you would open up the minds, the ears, and the hearts of all who hear me that your spirit would speak to them and that they would receive your truth, your peace, your love, and your mercy, and that we may in turn spread that same truth, that same love to all those with whom we come into contact. We give you all praise and glory and honor right now as we endeavor to bring your word to the people. We give thanks in the name of your Son, Jesus, our Savior. Amen. I want to open up our lesson study right now with, um, with a, a scripture from the 122nd Psalm. The opening verse of Psalm 122, King David writes, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. We are meeting once again in the house of the Lord, well, outside the house of the Lord. We are having outdoor church instead of indoor church, but at least we are having church. We are gathering together and worshiping God together. Whether indoors or outdoors doesn't make a difference. We are worshiping God. And we invite you to join with us. Our lesson study this morning, titled A Step in Faith, we're going to look at the lives and the ministries of a few select people from Scripture. And it is my prayer that we are able to take a lesson from this from these lives that have so impacted Christians down through the centuries, so that we can use their examples and Christ's example and impact those lives that are around us. We haven't personally, at least I haven't, seen Jesus in body. He ascended into heaven nearly 2,000 years ago. So I take everything that I know about Christ by faith. Everything that I've been taught, everything that I've read, I take by faith. Now, just because I haven't seen Jesus with my own two eyes does not mean I have not felt his presence. I have. I have felt the power of the Holy Spirit. I have witnessed the awesomeness of the Spirit of God at work in the lives of people. I can even see the awesomeness of creation, God's spoken word, 
in the nature that is behind me through these church windows that, that you see. This is not an accident. This was created for us by a divine and loving God. He does exist. I don't have to see him to see evidence of him. I see evidence of him all day long, all around each and every one of us. So yeah, I take his existence by faith because I have not physically seen him, but I've seen what he does. I've seen what he has done. And I know that what he said he will do, he will do. I take that by faith. Why are we here? If we go back to the Garden of Eden and we go back to the first chapter of Genesis, we read the account of, of creation. That God in six days created the universe, created all of the plant life, the animal life, birds of the air, beasts of the field, and those that live in, in the seas and in the oceans and the rivers. And then God created us. He created man. By his own hands, he created man. And then on the seventh day, he rested. The question that I think a lot of people ask is, well, why did God do that? Why are we here? I think a simple answer is, God is love, and he wanted to share his love. And the best way that he could share his love was with us. He didn't create us to be toys. He didn't create us to be objects to put up on a shelf for him to admire. He created us so that he could live with us, so that he could commune with us, so that we could commune with him. He created us out of his great, unsearchable, unknowable love. And when Adam disobeyed God, through the deceptions of, of, of Satan, death and sin came into the world. And, of course, God knew that all of this was going to happen. And because of his great love for us, even knowing what was going to happen, that Satan would uh, defy God, and that Satan would tempt man into falling away from God, God prepared a way of escape for us. When we disobey God, the only remedy, the only penalty is death. That's the only thing that can, I, I guess, uh, assuage God's anger, God's wrath, is death. But God didn't want us to die. He wanted us to live. So what he planned, that Jesus planned with him and volunteered to do, is that Jesus, part of the Godhead, he would die for us. And in his death, the death of the one, we all die, but yet we live. The Apostle Paul, whom we're going to talk about in a little bit, mentioned in one of his letters that he dies daily. That he lives, but it is not he who lives, it is Christ who lives in him. So as Paul died to the flesh every single day, he died to the flesh so that Christ would be raised anew in him every single day. And through his sacrifice, the sacrifice of Paul, sacrificing his own will, his own desires for the will of God, even though he died in the flesh at the end of his life, he will be raised again when Christ comes in the newness of life, as will we all. Jesus' self sacrifice was one out of love. When we listen to other people talk about, oh, who killed Christ? 
and people get angry at the Romans or people get angry at the Jews. Well, you killed Christ. Nobody killed Jesus. Jesus gave himself for us. He didn't have to die. He didn't have to give himself. No one can do to God what they did unless God allows it. When Christ stood before Pontius Pilate, Jesus told Pilate that you can't do what you do unless God gives you the authority. Jesus gave himself. No one took his life. He gave it. That self-sacrifice that God would die for his creation, in his death we all die. With his resurrection we all live if we choose to live. We can still choose to die in our sin. But if we accept the sacrifice of Christ, we die to our own sin because of his death, but we live for him here, and we will also live with him there when he comes. But we need to make the decision. We need to make the choice to allow God to work in us for his glory and to work through us for our benefit. When Paul was writing a letter to the Philippians, he said this, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming into the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. When we read those words, I know that there are some people who believe in one God, and that is Jesus only. And there is only one God. But this one God has three separate and distinct personalities. God the Father, God the Son, who is Jesus Christ, and the Comforter, God the Holy Spirit. Years ago, and I'm going back to the mid-1980s, so probably 35 or so years ago, I heard probably one of the most interesting descriptions of the Godhead, the triune God, that I've ever heard in my life, and it's pretty simple. And it... A, a, a cook must have come up with this idea because it talks about describing the, uh, the Holy Trinity using a cherry pie. And if a cherry pie is cooked just right, the whole inside of that cherry pie where all the cherries and the juice and everything else is, is, is just, just one great big gooey, drippy mess but you have the nice crust on the outside. And if you take that crust and you take the knife and you slice that crust into three parts, you see three great big pieces of the same pie. But if you were able to look on the inside of that pie, you would not see any dividing lines at all because it's all one great big pie on the inside. No lines, no scars, no division. It's all one unified pie. The only division that we see is on the outside. Three distinct separate pieces, one same pie. And I thought that was the, the neatest way to explain the Godhead. Three separate distinct 
people or personalities, but one God. So they are all equal. They are in perfect unity. Jesus, when he walked this earth, he didn't do anything or say anything unless he saw the Father or heard the Father say it or do it. They were in perfect communion, perfect unity. God wants us to be with him the way that Jesus was with him. He wants us to be in perfect communion, perfect unity with Christ. In order for us to become united with Christ, we need to do as the Apostle Paul did, and that is to deny ourselves, give God the authority to take charge of our lives. For us to give up what control we think we have over our lives and let God work in us to change us into His likeness so that He can work through us for His righteousness. Jesus made Himself of no reputation. He was God. He is God. But yet He came in the form of a servant. The best leaders are those who are servants first. Everything that they do is for their people. The best example of a leader, of a servant, is to give his life for those that he loves, which is exactly what Jesus did. So his love, self-sacrificial and complete, total. He gave total surrender to his Father for us. How can we not give God total surrender for Him. Anything that we may have here, anything that we may sacrifice here, when we consider what is waiting for us in heaven, uh, it, it's totally worth it. Whatever sacrifice we think we have here is outweighed beyond measure by the glory of God to come. When the rich young ruler came to Christ and wanted to follow Jesus, Jesus told him first that you, he must obey all of the commandments. And the rich young ruler said, well, Master, all of this I've done my entire life. Jesus then gave him a sacrifice to choose. Sell everything that you have and give it away. Then, come follow me. And the rich young ruler was taken aback. He was shocked, scared, dismayed because he had great wealth. And he could not see sacrificing his material wealth for the blessings of God. He could not see what Jesus had in store. All he could see was his own trappings, his own surroundings, the wealth and the authority and the riches that he thought he had. But yet he denied the riches of God. And of his grace. He did not want to give up control of his life to God. There are other people who did, however. When we look at Jesus after his baptism and after his 40 days in the wilderness being tempted of Satan, Jesus goes in search of his disciples. The first two he comes up upon are a couple of fishermen, brothers. Simon, called Peter, and his brother Andrew. Now, the, the, the book of Matthew uh, talks about this story in, in very short, concise words. That Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee. He saw uh, Peter and Andrew, and he called out to them and said, Come follow me. And they dropped 
everything that they did and followed Jesus. Luke 5, however, gives us a little bit more insight into this decision. Simon and his brother Andrew are fishing. And Jesus is teaching a multitude of people. So Jesus steps into the boat, into in Peter and Andrew's boat. And he says, cast out from shore and put your nets over the side. So they do. They're fishermen. They expect to catch fish. They haul up their nets and the nets are empty. Then Jesus says, okay, put your nets on the other side of the boat. And they did. And there were so many fish in the net that their nets were breaking and about ready to swamp the boat. And Peter says, uh, Master, get away from me. I, I, I'm not worth all of this. I'm paraphrasing, of course. And because of what they just saw Jesus do, and because of what they heard him say to the multitude, Jesus said, cast down your nets. Come follow me. And Peter and Andrew did just that. They laid down their nets in the boat, and left everything behind, left wives and children, parents, left everything and went to follow Jesus and become his disciples, to become his eyes and ears and lips to the rest of the world. So their sacrifice was total. They gave up everything. Eventually, they gave up their lives. When we talk about Paul, Paul was a unique individual. He was uniquely gifted in that he was a very zealous person. When he was in training to become a, a priest in the temple, he was studying under the tutelage of Gamaliel, one of the uh, priests of the temple, one of the high up priests in the temple. And Paul was uh, just filled with zeal for the law to the point of persecuting and killing Christians, people that he believed were in violation of the law, people who were following Christ. It is believed, and I think rightly so, that Paul was present at the stoning of Stephen. Even though Paul uh, likely uh, didn't participate in the stoning, he held the, the coats and the cloaks of the people who did stone him. It's kind of ironic that uh, several times in his ministry afterwards that Paul himself was stoned, I think three times. But his conversion, when, when Paul was on the road to Damascus in Syria, and he meets Christ face to face on this road, and Paul's life is changed right then and there. Jesus tells him who he is. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. You think you're persecuting my people? You're persecuting me. And Paul knew that he was talking to God. And he was struck blind. Jesus sent him on into Damascus. You're going to go to the house of a man named Judas, and you are going to wait. Jesus talked to a man named Ananias in a dream, or in a vision, and said, go to the house of Judas. You're going to find a man named Saul of Tarsus, and you are going to pray for him, and his, his vision, his sight, will be restored. And of course, Ananias had heard all about Paul, about how ruthless he was in the persecution of Christians. Jesus said, don't worry about it. He's mine. I've called him to do a great work. You just do what I told you to do. So he does. He prays for Paul. And scales fall off of his eyes. His vision is restored. Not perfectly, of course but well enough that he could, he could see to travel. 
and he could still uh, make tents because that was his training, uh, you know, his livelihood. He, he was a tent maker. He could still do that. Writing was a little bit more uh, difficult for him. If he wrote himself, he had to write in big letters so he could see better. But he was just as filled with zeal for Christ as he was against, uh, against Christ. That was what made Paul so unique. Now, instead of being a persecutor of Christians, he became one who was persecuted. And he did all for the love of God. There's a, a, a preacher by the name of Arthur Blessed. And he is widely known for traveling the world carrying a cross. Now, of course, his cross, uh, initially, his cross, uh, he, he wore out several crosses because dragging them on the ground, uh, the, the crosses would wear out due to friction. So uh, he, the, I don't know how many crosses he went through, but then he built one that had a set of wheels on the bottom. And when he goes from country to country by foot, he carries this cross with him. And he preaches the gospel of Christ. He preaches the message of the cross of Christ. When we think about our own American history, and uh, we hear the stories of the shot heard around the world uh, at, at the Battle of Concord uh, in 1775, we look at what uh, Arthur Blessed is doing, carrying this cross around the world, literally carrying this cross around the world. I would call this the cross heard around the world. Such is his own particular love for Christ. This is his ministry. This is what he does to bring the message of the cross of Christ to people in a literal sense and bringing the message of the love of Christ to transform lives and to bring souls into heaven. When we love someone, that commitment is more than just a surface kind of love. When a husband loves a wife, or a wife her husband, or parents love their children, um, or love for, for aging parents, love for friends, the deepness of that love, the kind of love where we would do anything for that person, even if necessary, lay down our lives for that person because of our love for them. That's just part of the commitment of love that we share to one another. That's the a same type of commitment of love that Christ has for us, that he did lay down his life for us. Scripture records that greater love has no man than he laid down his life for a friend. Jesus embodied that kind of love. He had the greatest love of all in that he laid down his life not just for one man. He laid down his life for all men. And it is that kind of love that he wants us to embody towards each other, especially towards him. Give up what control we think we have, what desires we have, for, our, for ourselves, and do what He wants us to do. Now, God's not asking us all to be an Arthur Blessed and drag a cross around the world and, and be an evangelist. He's not. Those callings are for specific people. God calls each and every one of us with the blessings and the gifts that He gives us. We each have different blessings. We each have different gifts. But God wants us to use those gifts that we each uniquely have to do a unique work for Him. 
and that is our duty for him. That is our commitment to him, our commitment of love. As we close out our lesson study this morning, I want to issue a challenge, if you will, and not just to you, but to myself as well. In the world in which we live, in our daily lives that consume so much of our thought process, so much of our abilities, so much of our physical exertion, it is often the case that God takes a back seat. In my own life and in yours, I make this challenge that we, as followers of Christ, every day when we get up, the first thing that we say, the first thoughts that we come to is to thank God for another day, for another opportunity, to do what we do and to do it for Him. The last thing that we do at night when we lay our heads down to sleep for our bodies and our minds to rest and recuperate and regenerate is to thank God for the day that we just had. To thank Him for the blessings, to thank Him for the victories, but to also thank Him for the defeats which, which is hard to do. To thank God for the persecutions that we may have endured during the day. Because everything works together, good and bad, for, for our good, to those that love God and are called according to His purpose. Just as the refiner's fire removes impurities from silver and from gold, and all, all of the trash, all of the garbage comes up to the surface so that the, the refiner can scrape off all of the impurities. When that refiner looks down at his end product, that purified silver, that purified gold looks like a mirror, and the refiner sees himself in that reflection. When we suffer for the cause of Christ, whatever we suffer for the cause of Christ, it is for our benefit. It's to get rid of everything in our lives that should not be there. So that when God looks at us, He doesn't see us. He sees Himself. He sees the reflection of the refiner, which is God. And when we are able to do that, we can stand before God, regardless of what Satan may say about us. This person did this, that, and the other thing. This, this person is, is lost. This person is unsavable. And there are people out there who think that they are unsavable. I've done so much garbage in my life that God can't forgive me. Well, if that were true, then he wouldn't be a very powerful God if we can sin greater and God's ability to forgive. If God is uh, all-powerful, which He is, He can forgive any sin except blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That's the one sin that's unforgivable according to Scripture. But whatever we may think we do that is unforgivable, God has already forgiven it. All we have to do is reach out and accept His forgiveness and allow His Spirit to transform us into His likeness and wipe away all of the garbage in our lives so that the only thing that God sees when He sees us is Himself. And I want to close this lesson study in, in, a, in just a brief word of prayer. Precious Heavenly Father, we come once again before Your throne thanking You for your love, which is unknowable, unsearchable, and undeniable. 
We thank you for your grace, which is boundless. We thank you for your son and for his sacrifice. Father, we ask for your continued grace and for the strength of your Holy Spirit in our lives that every moment of every day of, of our lives you would be with us and that you would speak to us and through us that we would see an opportunity know an opportunity when it is presented to us for us to be a witness for you to, to a lost and dying world. And Father, may you be glorified in our witness. May you be glorified in our sacrifice. For, as Paul said, we die daily, but yet we live. But yet it is not we who live, but it is you who lives in us. We thank you in the name of your Son, Jesus, our Redeemer. Amen. God bless you all. Have a happy Sabbath. May you be blessed, but may you also go forth and be a blessing. God bless you.